Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Path of Exile. My plans for doing a walkthrough on this game have kind of taken a slight hold right now, as Path of Exile is just a little over a week away from going into open beta. Open beta means character wipes, so starting now would be kind of foolish. But in the meantime, what I can do is try and give you guys a primer into what it, what to expect here in Path of Exile and what differences you might run across between this game, Diablo 3, and Torchlight 2. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos regarding Path of Exile, then you need to know that this game has been updated a lot since I last looked at it. I have not been making content on it, and I haven't really been following it as much as I should have been. But I do know that lots of really good changes have occurred. New skills, revamped skill trees, the works have been done to this game. And I really think that it deserves your attention, especially if you enjoy action RPG games like Diablo, Torchlight, or Titan's Quest. So one of the main changes that have happened here that I'm exceptionally happy about is the fact that there is voice acting in the game now, and you'll see that as I go through here. So let's start off. What can you expect when you start the game for the first time and as far as character options are concerned? Well, first off, you're going to have a few different leagues you can go through. You've got your default league and you've got your hardcore league. Um, and as you can see, characters are moved to legacy leagues after large balance, balance changes have been made. So my character, my primary character, is now in a legacy league. This you won't have to worry about at the very beginning. You'll pretty much have to worry about the default and, of course, the hardcore. Difference being, of course, hardcore characters staying dead, much like they would in other hardcore games. Alright, so you've got six characters in this game. Starting on the left... We have ourselves the Templar. This is a strength intelligence hybrid class. Next to him, the Shadow, a dexterity intelligence hybrid class. We then move on to the Marauder, who is a pure strength class. The Ranger, who is our pure dexterity user in this game. The Duelist, who uses a combination of strength and dexterity to dispatch his foes. And then, of course, lastly, but not least, the Witch, the intelligence user of this game. So you might be asking, well, what's the difference between the characters and what can they provide you? Well, this isn't like... Uh, basically Diablo or Torchlight where you pick a class and they're going to have very specific skills. In this game, every class can really use every skill. The difference is going to be what your primary attributes are. So whether it be strength, int, or dex, or again, some com combination thereof. The other difference is your starting weapon, of course, will change. When you start the game, you'll have a weapon that spawns next to you, and that will be dictated by your class. And you will get different skills as rewards as you complete the story. So, yes, there are some skills that you will get ahead of other characters because they're part of your character progression. Other differences happen in the skill tree. Let me go ahead and pick up my old character here to kind of show you that. Alright, so here's the passive skill tree, and as you can see, it is just as big as ever. However, you might notice it has taken a few changes since I last looked at it. Between the six classes, you have six different starting areas on this tree. My Witch starts here at the top, and you can see there are different locations here. Uh, this looks like this will be the Templar, which has mana and melee here. So the Templar will start here in the upper left, which means strength will probably be here life and melee so here would be your marauder so if this is strength this will be the duelist here where for strength and dexterity ranger over here for pure dexterity and of course dex and int would put the shadow over here and so as you can see each character starts at different locations on the skill tree the good news is as they've lowered the number of nodes between each of these areas from the last time I've played. So you can actually zip around this skill tree pretty good now. Uh, but of course, it'll be a little easier to pick a class that uh, has the skill locations that you're looking for. So this is the big thing for those of you who are new to Path of Exile. This is how your characters progress. All of the things you can get uh, for your character will happen here. 
you're not going to get any new abilities on this. These are This is not a skill tree as it really is more of a passive tree. This will change the fundamentals of your character. As you can see, there are small nodes and there are larger nodes. Uh, and each one, of course, has a variance in power. The smaller nodes are typically minor increases. As you can see here, my witch has a chance to start with either spell damage or mana regeneration. I actually want a little bit of the mana regeneration. As you can see here, it goes into maximum mana and then plus intelligence. Uh, and then, of course, I'll be going here into spell damage, and I can then move on to gain intelligence, or I can take one of these primary paths here to increase intelligence, also to get my strength up if I want. This is important, actually, as you'll want to be careful as to the gear you pick up. I'll show you real fast. This wand I have requires 65 intelligence. Thankfully, if I look at my character panel, I already have 55, so I only need 10. That means on this skill tree, I just need to pick up one of these nodes to be able to use it. But as you progress, the gear you pick up may also help you dictate where you want to go on this passive tree. Now you're going to have to be careful. This is one of the things that I both like and dislike about this game. This passive tree allows you to basically create the kind of character you want. There are so many different options here. I mean, just here in the witches area, you can see that I can go into spell damage, I can go into mana. These converge here into a first ability called Lord of the Dead, which gives me additional health and minions that I can have uh, for this character. This character is based around summoning. Uh, I can also go into increasing damages for each of my elemental types of damage. Now, these are just kind of the minor ones, to be honest with you. And the beautiful thing is you can find what you're looking for usually at a glance, because you'll notice there are icons in the center of each of these that kind of show you roughly what these skills are about. So here you can see this is with wands, and it's got kind of a wand icon there. Uh, this over here is number of specters, and you can see there's kind of a specter uh, icon there, and it helps with minions. So being a summoner, I will probably want to venture over into this corner of this passive map. Well, besides these, you've got these bigger ones here, such as Elemental Equilibrium. Any enemy I hit with elemental damage, they'll gain a resistance to the element that I hit them with, but a reduced resistance to opposing our elements, or the other elements, not just opposing. Uh, so that gives me a gameplay style where I can do more damage if I keep swapping around the different types of elements I use. That's a gameplay choice. I don't have to go into that. I could go up here into minion instability, where my minions will explode when they're low on life and do a percentage of their maximum damage. Further up here, you can see I can get hexes, where my hexes will never expire, and Whispers of Doom, which allows me to have one additional curse. Typically, you could only have one on an enemy. There are lots of these. Going over here, Eldric Battery converts all energy shield to mana. Over here, Chaos Inoculation. Maximum life becomes one, but you're immune to chaos damage, and you have 50% more energy shields. That means if you take da any damage to your health, you're dead. But Chaos Damage, which is the poison damage for this game, you are immune to, and you have more shields. So that's the skill tree. There is so much here that I really can't even begin to go into this and tell you what kind of builds to make, because I haven't even gotten that far. This character is not that high. Okay. Um, but since we're talking about customization here, that that's the big thing, is customization. This is great, right? I've just talked about what's so great about it is you can make what character you want. Well, here's the downside. It is very hard to take back your choices. You get certain respect points here, right? But you get them for completing quests. But you don't get a lot of them. And the respects only allow you to take back one note at a time. So, for example, since I hit mana regeneration, I can take that back by using my one respect point and I could only take that one back. So if I started putting a whole bunch of points in, I could only go back one skill level. So you have a chance to take some things back, but not all of them. Later in the game, there are currencies that you can use to gain back additional respect points. But that becomes very expensive. To completely rebuild your character from scratch is so expensive, you might even be better off just creating a new one. It, you're really gonna wanna plan a bit, and you might even make multiple characters to try things out. Uh, keep in mind you only have a limited number of character slots. So that is the good thing and the bad thing. There is tons of customization here, but you kind of have to foreplan it, or just kind of play around with it and see where it goes as you play with it. 
So since I was talking about energy shields and health, let me kind of go over the way this game does uh, its items and the way you gear up. And as you can see over here in the lower left, I have my health globe, and you'll notice there's kind of a white or bluish uh, thing surrounding it here. This is your standard life, which all ARPGs have, and that's what you start with. Next to this is the shields, as you can see, shields of 137. Any damage I take hits my shields first, and then starts to go into my life. So that one ability on the passive tree would put my life to one hit point, but give me 50% more of my shields. Now this is great because shields are a regenerative resource. After I take a few damage to my shields, if I stay out of combat for a while, my shields will regenerate. It's almost like playing maybe Halo or something like that, where basically you take damage, you leave the fight, and you, or try not to get hit for as long as possible until your shields start to regenerate. Health, on the other hand, does not do this unless you're wearing any kind of specific gear for that, and you'll have to use your potions. More on those in a moment. So the kind of gear you get is based on your character class. So let me go over here to this. This is the basic cloth type. Cloth increases energy shields. So pure cloth is an intelligence item. As you can see, it requires the most out of intelligence, and that'll increase your shield. So each character you pick is going to be dictate what kind of defensive type you are. Strength typically gives armor. I believe I have something here uh, that's evasion and energy shield. I may not have an actual strength type weapon. Uh, strength will basically increase armor. So as a melee user, strength user, you're expected to get hit and take damage. Strength, of course, it gives you raw armor, which allows you to take less damage over time. Dexterity classes will have evasion, such as this item here. Evasion rating, of course, pr prevents you from getting hit. So the dexterity users will focus on not getting hit, getting hit at all, rather than taking any kind of hit. Uh, as opposed to intelligence users who get energy shield. So there you go. Strength characters are expected to be in the thick of the fight. They're going to take damage. Uh, the beautiful thing is in this game you have not necessarily an unlimited resource in your potions, but potions are very easy to get back. Um, it's kind of a hybrid between the old potion system of Diablo and maybe even the health globe system of Diablo 3, uh, simply because you'll get them back as you fight. And of course, dexterity, you don't want to get hit. Uh, casters, you can get hit, but you have to avoid hits for a while in order to regenerate. So there you go. There's three very distinctive uh, play styles for those characters. Now, how do you get skills, you might ask? I haven't shown you any kind of skill bar or anything like that. Well, the skills are given to you through gems. Let me go over my uh, wand here again. And you can see it's got three different slots in it here. Uh, these are blue colored slots, which mean they are intelligence based, and that's where I get my skills. You can see I have my fireball slotted here. I have firestorm slotted here. So let me kind of go out into a field so you can see these. All right, so this wand will not give me its stats, but I should still be able to. Use, well, I have fireball slotted to another one. I don't have firestorm. Let's do this real quick since I need intelligence. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to actually put a few points into my skill tree. I'll give myself damage. I can do cast speed and critical strike chance. That's a tough choice, I'm going to be quite honest with you. Because that leads into one thing that, of this game that I'm still uh, don't entirely like, and that's casting can sometimes feel very prohibitive. You cast and you spend a long time casting and before you can move. So it's very difficult to kite at times against faster enemies. So cast speed can be very important. From there I'm going to go into here and I'm just going to go ahead and get my 30 intelligence. There we go. Now as you can see my skills have suddenly become available now that I meet the requirements to use this weapon. So I've got my fireball and I've got my firestorm. So I'll kind of show you there's my fireball. As you see, there's kind of a long delay there between when I can fire and move. Uh, and then, of course, here's my Firestorm. Now, the way these sockets work is... Uh, let me show you the difference here. This one here, you'll notice there's nothing in between. Whereas this one here, you'll notice there's a link. Anything like this, you can use the sockets for the item. And you will get the spell that is socketed into the item. But ones like this that are linked will allow you to use what are called Augment Gems. It's for example, this one. This is a chance to ignite. It's a support gem, and it allows you to augment these skills. 
This gives me a 25% chance to ignite any enemy hit with fire damage. Because I have it here in the center and it's linked between these two, that gives me a chance to ignite with both Firestorm and Fireball. Now, let's assume that the spell here... Not many life spell here, Cold Snap. Let's assume that was a fire spell. Just, just for the sake of argument. Here's your, my Cold Snap. If that was a fire spell, it would not benefit from this chance to ignite. I have the chance to ignite, but it's not linked to this other spell. It has to be linked on the item that I have it equipped. And that's how you're going to get your... You're going to get these from rewards, and you're going to find them on the ground. And as you play, your skills are going to level up. You can see here that because this is getting close, this is my minion life, it's getting close to level. It gets a percentage of my experience. I don't have to use it. I actually do not have to use minion life, fireball, or my frost spells to gain experience for those skills. It's not like a Skyrim or anything like that, where the more you use the skill, the more it levels up. It's a flat percentage of everything you get for everything that you kill. And you might ask, why would I not want to do this? Why would I? Why shouldn't I upgrade these? Well, uh, there are different reasons. It really depends on the gem. Certain spells will gain quite a bit of mana cost as they level up, and you may want to keep the mana cost low. Combine that with you may want to augment certain spells to make you can actually get things that will make your spells cast either faster or hit harder, uh, something like that. You get that. There we go. So you may want to go ahead and keep a spell low itself and then use these support gems in order to buff it some other way. So for example, you might have a spell that you want to keep low, but you want to get multiple projectiles on it. There are multiple. There is a gem that allows you to get multiple projectiles when you cast a spell, or even attack for uh, the dexterity users out there. Now, just because I'm an intelligence user, don't think that I have to have all blue gems. I just so happen to have all blue gems. I could use dexterity gems if I have the stats for them. It, that means that I could use things like traps that the uh, ranger might use, for example. So I could actually use those abilities at any time as long as I meet the requirements. So let me go into the character tab once we've uh, taken him out. And what I'll do is I'll summon a zombie from his corpse. There we go. Fantastic. Of course, you can see I have my standard attack, which is my left mouse button. And the beautiful thing is the game's uh, controls are definitely customizable here. So I use the Q, W, E, R, and T for these primary abilities you can see here in the lower right. Those are, of course, rebindable at any point. And let's just kind of get through this guy real quick. Uh, I can summon another zombie. And I can even try and freeze him, but of course he appears to not want to be frozen. Ah, he resists lightning, cold, and all that wonderful stuff. So yes, monsters in this game, much like other action RPGs, can be uh, blessed or buffed with certain abilities, uh, attributes, that make them difficult to kill. Oh boy, there's a lot of monsters here. Okay, as you can see here, I'm running out of mana. This is this is good. I'll demonstrate this real quick then. I'm going to use one of my potions. I'll use potion number four. And uh, you can see it kind of went down a tiny bit. Let me use it again. You can see it more there in the lower left-hand corner. There we go. I'll use it again. And using a potion is not that bad. And this is what I was talking about, a hybrid system. Uh, I don't have to carry a number of potions. Like in Diablo, you basically cover, carried a whole bunch of potions, and you spam them to stay alive. Uh, you could definitely spam these potions to a point. You can only have five active at any time, though. The beautiful thing, though, is they will recharge. So as I kill things, let me just kind of do that. I'll go down here, and you can see that it uh, recovers mana over seven seconds, and it consumes charges on you. So it says it consumes 18 of the 62 charges it has. It currently has 17. As I kill monsters, it's going to fill up. So obviously I used a lot of this potion, and uh, it's going to take a little bit to refill. 
but that's the beautiful thing is so as you're playing as you're fighting along you don't have to worry about uh, using it and needing to go find more you can just recharge it as you go along see there you go it's actually recharging fairly quickly now all right so as it gets enough charges to be used it should fill up graphically down here at the bottom so you'll always have some kind of resource. And the beautiful thing about these flasks is, as you can see, is they have different modifications on them. Flasks are considered an item type in this game. So they can have random properties on them just like anything else. As a matter of fact, you can see here I picked up a greater mana flask. It has the default properties of 120 mana over 5.6, and you can see it consumes 20 or 40 charges on use. So obviously I can only use this one twice once it fills up completely based on those stats. Well... Throughout the game, you're going to get these Scroll of Wisdom, which are basically identify scrolls. And you can just simply use that to identify the item, and there we go. While I use it, I have immunity to curses during the flask effect, and it also removes curses on you. So, even though it only allows me to use it twice, this will allow me to take off a negative status effect. So, your flask choice isn't just about health and mana, and there are rejuvenation ones, which do both. It's not just about that. It's about other stats that they can get, and you can actually use them to your advantage. There are actually other potions I've seen, too, that increase resistances. I found, I believe, a lightning resist potion that I could use, and I can show you that. So that's kind of gear in a nutshell. I'm trying not to go too in-depth on this because this is just a primer to get you started. I'm going to assume that you have some basic action RPG experience behind you, such as Diablo and Torchlight, when you're watching this. So let me show you... Uh, well, first, hey, Hello. voice acting. Lovely. Um, well, I, obviously you have your options panel. You can see here everything is rebindable, so feel free to choose what you want in here. Plenty of graphics options in here, honestly. The very impressive uh, work they've done here. Uh, you have your map system mini-map in the upper right-hand corner. You can turn that off in options. Of course, you can hit tab or hit this button here to put it in the center. Uh, you have a social panel. So this is your party in interface. You can go to the notice board or you can hit the social panel here. And you can actually see parties that are happening in the game. As of right now, there are none in this game. I'm in the Legacy area. They're doing a hardcore uh, race right now, I believe. So that means people are probably playing that instead. But you can always create your own party and make it public so people can join it. Um, when you go out of these town hubs, you go out in kind of an instanced area. So you're not going to see other players unless they're in your party. So it plays like Diablo Torchlight in that aspect that you're not going to see party members unless they actively join you. You will see them in kind of hubs like this. So that plays almost kind of like Guild Wars does. In Guild Wars 1 at least you had um, hub cities that you could see other players and then as you went out everything was instant. So it kind of plays out like that here. You have a shared stash. All of your characters get access to this. And for some reason, I have remove only tabs. I wonder about that. So here's that flask I was telling you about. This is the Topaz Flask of Resistance. It gives me additional elemental resistance during the effect. So you have quite a few uh, different types of options for your flasks. And here are some gems I was telling you about before. These are dexterity type gems. You can see some of these have leveled, and I just haven't leveled them yet. Uh, the other thing about leveling gems, and since I mentioned about why you wouldn't want to, sometimes the requirements of those gems go up when you level them. And if I level this gem up above the level that I can use it, then, of course, obviously I could st I'd have to stop using it. So there are certain reasons why you wouldn't level up gems. Uh, aside from maybe you want to level up a gem to a certain point and not level it further for a alt that you have. There is always that. So this game doesn't use standard currencies. It doesn't use gold. Everything I have in here is kind of a currency. I have uh, blacksmith whetstones, orbs of transmutation, scouring, things like that. The item system in this game is very random, much like Diablo, but you can actually change every single one of your items to your liking. So for example here, I can change the color of the sockets on an item. If I use this on, say, this helm here, you notice how it's uh, green and red. Well, I can use this to change these to hopefully get blues to use on this character. You can see this is more for a Templar character because it's got armor and energy shield on it. Uh, here I have an item that will increase the quality of an armor. 
uh, so it'll get more armor or shields when I use that. Here I can upgrade an item to a magic item, so just like in the, in other ARPGs, you have different qualities. Everything uh, Here I have a Scholar's Rope. There we go. That's white. I'll just go ahead and show real quick how this works. And I can do this to normal to a magic. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Boom. There it is. It's turned magical. It's now blue. Maybe I didn't like the stats it rolled with. Oh, of course, remove only. I have no idea why that is happening. Okay. Uh, apparently they might have changed how many slots I had during uh, one of the updates and uh, that's how they're dealing with that. That's okay. So here, uh, enchants a magic item with a new random property. Or here, restores uh, or reforges a magic item with new random properties completely. I could take that item I just got and say I didn't like what it's got. It's got energy shield, lightning resistance. You know, I actually kind of like those, but for the sake of demonstration, let me just kind of show you. I can actually re-roll it. See, there we go. Maximum life and life regeneration on it. That's not too bad. So I can enchant an item with a new random property. I could go in here. I can uh, upgrade a normal item to a random rarity. So instead of magical, I could make it rare. Uh, whatever the different levels that they have in this. I honestly don't know how many levels they have. Uh, then I have, of course, here. I can remove all the properties from an item. I can reforge how many sockets it has. Increase the quality of weapons. These are all ways of changing your items and getting the items that you want. And they still are random. The, and they're also used for currency. So let me go up here and see. I can go into purchase items and you'll see here how this works. As you go to purchase items you'll notice here I have a cost of scrolls of wisdom. So I'll use my identify scrolls to buy items. Here this costs an orb of augmentation. Transmutation here. Uh, basically in two orbs of scouring. So this game uses a trade and barter system. You basically, you'll never get gold. You'll simply go to a shop and you can trade these orbs and things like that that you've found in the game for other items. And the way you get these, let me kind of take, um, see I've got a bunch of items here to kind of show off. This is another thing that I really can't explain well enough and I really urge you to go out and look, uh, is the way that you sell items in this game. There are what they call vendor recipes. If I sell certain items or certain combinations of items, I will get better loot. Well, let's say I sell this here, right? This composite bow. You'll notice it gives me transmutation shard offer, right? If I were just to put in, let's put in something kind of basic here. Use control there. This transmutation shard. A lot of basic items like whites. Let me see if I can do it with this. Just yes, show it to me. I uh, see alteration shards, so it's completely different. Uh, what items you can put in there and what you'll get from them. Typically, in, as you start off, you'll get pieces of scrolls of wisdom, and you, you have to combine those to get the full scrolls. So that's how you're going to get all these items you need. But let's take this, and unless they've changed the recipe, this has got a green, a blue, and a red. That should give me an orb that actually allows you to re-roll... Okay, they, they have changed it on me. It used to be this would give you a full orb to change the colors there. But basically, the different items you put in, as you can see, will give you different barter results at the top. As of right now, all these items are giving me transmutation shards. And, of course, I need 20 for it to become an orb. If I put in the mana flask in here, ah, there we go. There's a scroll fragment for the scrolls of wisdom, and that only requires five. So I can hit accept. There we go. I now have these different fragments that I can use to later combine. Now, if you've got items with similar names in them, uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything quite that I could show you. Oh, wow, they've unidentified all this. Okay, I never identified these. All right. Items with certain modifications and have similar modifications can be sold, and then the vendors will give you... Uh, upgraded rewards for giving them these pieces of like what you might consider a set and that's how that works you're gonna you're gonna have to go out and look on that one because i have not really looked too much into it uh, but i've heard a lot about it and it's really an interesting system that instead of crafting doing crafting of your own you can craft by basically selling different items so you think about that being kind of putting your items in your heraldic cube or something like that to get you what you want 
Okay, well, let's just kind of quickly go through the rest here. Um, I do want to show you here that much like Torchlight and Diablo 2, you can swap weapons. Uh, weapon 1 and Weapon 2, and this will affect the skills that you have equipped. As you can see here, the skills that are in my wand will go away when I swap over to Weapon 2. That, I believe, is default... Uh, no, default X, it looks like. Okay. Again, completely rebindable. Uh, here's your character stat screen. You can see what your primary stats are. You do not affect these in any way. These are only affect in this screen anyway. You affect these by going into your passive tree to bring these up. So if you've got equipment you want to use, you'll have to use that. This is very in-depth, by the way. Uh, you can basically look at all sorts of different stats for each skill that you have. Simply highlight the skill, and then you can go down here to take a look at all the different percentages of that skill. So you don't have to wonder, did this gem I just used or did this passive I just used give me the stats that I really thought I got. Alright, and here is the world map panel, the U button. This will show you your location. You can switch between the acts here at the top. And down here is the quest system. On the right are quests you've completed. They are grayed out. On the left are the quests you can do. As you click on them, you'll notice it shows you what location you need to go to as the map branches out. These are actually all the locations that I've gone to, and it actually lets you know how many exits are in an area. So in this case, I can see that I can take this... Uh, there's a forest waypoint that's kind of to the south. To the west is the river crossing, as you saw by me going west this way, and then sort of right is the old fields. These pretty much correlate to the directions you have to go to on that map. So if you see this and you see that there's these four exits, you know that you can go west, north, east, south, and you're going to have some kind of exit in those directions. For each of these nodes, you're going to have these blue dots. These are waypoints. I can go to those by using the waypoint system here. Simply click here, and then I can click on one of these to actually travel there. If you see a small dot like this one, it means that map has a waypoint, but you haven't discovered it yet. So if you're trying to get back to town, keep an eye out for those, and that's a way to get back. As you click on the active quests on the left, you'll notice it tells you which direction to go and your final destination. So you can see here this quest actually has multiple parts which I have to branch out to the west and to the east. This can help you plan as if you're wanting to get equipment, you might want to complete something like this which is a short jaunt over and over in a simple single area as opposed to this one which has multiple parts. So that will help you plan how you work out uh, your destinations. All right, lastly, there is this button here that has the microtransaction stash. This is where you all your microtransaction items will be available to put into your inventory. As of right now, though, uh, the only things available on the real money shop are extra character slots and extra st uh, stash slots. Uh, there will be other stuff added later. Unfortunately, at this time, I'm really not sure what kind of items they plan to sell in the cash shop. As of right now, uh, those simple items of character slots and stash slots are very much cosmetic. You will not pay for any kind of power or anything like that at the moment. Uh, so I'm looking forward to see what else they will do, if they'll be simply cosmetic side grades or something of like, maybe even pets, as they do have a Kiwi pet that you can get for donating into the game. So, don't know much about that yet. This will take you, hitting the online shop will hit you to your web browser to look into that. So that, these are the basics. Like I said, unfortunately I apologize, there's not really a lot of action as far as gameplay is concerned. I think you can kind of get a feel that it's much like your standard fair Diablo Torchlight game. But I wanted to go over the kind of the main differences that you can expect if you want to get into this game. It is a, about a week away and uh, again this is completely completely free to play. You will pay nothing to try it out. Uh, so no, there is no one-time purchase like say Guild Wars you, where you had to pay one time and then you didn't pay a subscription. Now this is you're gonna be able to download it, you're gonna be able to go to Path of Exile's website and just grab it and then just start playing right away. Um, and then, as you can see, everything in the game is, as of right now, easily obtainable from the game, from playing it. Nothing really other than the, the aforementioned slots uh, to purchase. So if you're interested in action RPGs, you're looking for an alternative, perhaps, to Diablo, 
then this would be something that you could definitely try out and it is at no risk to you. The gameplay, I'll just to give you a kind of rough idea since I haven't played it with a lot of the recent patching, uh, I can tell you from my initial impressions that the game does feel very good. Uh, feels, uh, you know, quite polished for a free to play and indie developed game. It is looking very strong. There are only a few minor issues that I've had with it, and uh, again, that kind of it's about the smoothness of the combat. Uh, but then again, it's very hard to, in my mind to match something the smooth combat that Diablo has at the at the time. Uh, but there is so much more this game also has to offer, such as customizability and uh, future content. I mean, th right now in this beta, only Acts One and Two are available. And, uh, of course, there are multiple difficulty paths just like Torchlight and Diablo. Uh, so you can keep playing, getting stronger, getting better items, uh, get, getting more power. But when open beta hits, here in a week, Act 3 will be released. And that's not even, that's, as far as I know, that's not even the final act. That's not even my final form. Yes. So there will be more to come. Plenty more, and you don't have to pay for that. It will just be given to you. At least I haven't heard any plans for them to ask Lee, have you pay for those? But that's so. As, there's lots more potential here. Lastly, to kind of maybe whet your appetite a little bit to give you an idea of what you expect in the end game, because that is something that has been a contentious part for uh, Diablo players at the very least. Yeah, so what, what are you going to do at the, the end of the game? Well, this game has a mapping system where you basically find map fragments and you use these map fragments to create a random location, a random dungeon. These map fragments are much like items that you find in the game and will contain random properties. And you can also re-roll those map fragments just like you can re-roll regular items like I showed you with the orbs that, exi that exist out in the world. This allows you to basically create an infinite number of randomly generated dungeons that work how you want to. Maybe you want to make the enemies super strong and then drop more loot. Maybe you want to make the dungeon be a maze that you have to traverse. Maybe you want to have damage floors to add additional difficulty. And each one of these will typically add some kind of reward to the risk that you're taking. So there is lots to do at the end game. Again, completely randomly generated, which is something I know has been a contentious point for players of the Diablo series. So there you have it. This is Path of Exile coming out again roughly a week from now. I will leave the information at the bottom of the video here in the video description for you to go out and grab it. You can still, before it comes out, donate to the game in order to get in early if you want. Keep in mind though that when the game does come out, the characters will be wiped. Everybody will be starting over fresh. Alright, I'm Kagekaze. This has been a primer for Path of Exile. If there's any questions that I could possibly answer, please feel free to ask. Or if there's anything that you want to add in the comments, of course, for anyone that might be interested and might be watching, please do. I am by no means the final resource to this, especially because I have been out of the game for a very long time. So... Uh, I'm really interested to see where this game goes, how it finishes up. I really want to see how Act 3 looks. I haven't really been looking at the pictures they've been releasing. I'm kind of wanting it to be a slight surprise. We'll see how long that lasts. All right, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.